Uh, a why is having a lot of Sincere. Sincere. Gracias. De la Universidad de Adelaide en Australia. The talk, the title of the talk is the following Condition for Zero Duality Gap in Convex Programming. And uh, I see the joint work with uh, some other people I know very well. Okay, thank you very much, Michel, and thank you to the organizers, Lola, Juan, and Javier, for, for inviting me. I, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and, and I'm very thankful that they made the space for me in this beautiful set of talks, which were really great. I'm, I'm very happy that I was able to, to come here. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so. Um, this is a um, work together with Jonathan Borwin, who arrived in Australia in 2007, and Liang Jin Zhao, who was a PhD student of Heinz Bauschke, and he was a postdoc of, of Jonathan for a while. And this is about conditions of zero duality gap in convex programming, and I'm very happy that many people here spoke about several concepts that I'm going to uh, mention, so um, I will have the opportunity to pass some of the slides a little bit quicker. So I will start by giving some framework, and this will not last very long, and I will speak about a well-known closedness uh, condition for zero duality gap, and then I will introduce a new notion of condition which might be related with the uh, condition that uh, Abderrahim has presented uh, recently. And uh, I will just recall the well-known interiority conditions for zero duality gap. And then I will uh, give a full uh, picture about what is known of the comparison between the, um, optimal, uh, between the constraint qualifications and some consequences if I have enough time. So the setting is uh, very general. We work with a locally convex topological space and a proper lower semi-continuous function. And uh, these uh, concepts have been presented several times here for many people, conjugate functions, epigraph, etc. And uh, uh, the epsilon subdifferential as well. This is a, a very important concept uh, as we all have seen today. And uh, the setting, uh, what I wanted to emphasize is the model of the optimization problem we are going to use. So the spaces, again, uh, locally convex topological spaces, but this is just because we need a space in which we can use separation properties, separation properties with linear functions. So that's the, the reason for using these spaces and the functions. We have a finite number of convex functions which are proper lower semi-continuous and convex. And the optimization problem we consider, some of you might be uh, familiar with this structure, which is the sum of functions which are uh, specialized in separated uh, variables. So uh, these uh, are independent variables, and you have a finite number of functions, each of one uh, on these uh, independent variables, and you want to minimize the sum of them. So this is a, a typical uh, f problem which would be uh, trivial if you wouldn't have constraints. So if it's unconstrained, then you minimize each of the functions and you are done. But we uh, consider this uh, constraint, which is a closed subspace of the product space of the whole, of the whole uh, x1, xm, uh, spaces. So you have the product, a scalar product of finite, finite spaces, and you take a closed subspace in this product, and then you want to minimize the sum of these functions. This model uh, was studied by Rockefeller, known as monotropic, monotropic he called because of these single variables, but he did not assume that the functions can take infinite value. So he, he uh, restricted his studies to, to continuous convex functions. So we will 
consider functions that go to infinity and this will allow us to to have this model as a model that also serves for the general convex optimization problem. So every convex optimization problem can be modeled in this way. And we like it because it gives a very nice symmetry property with the dual. You know there is this uh, uh, sentence by Borges that says reality likes symmetries. A la realidad le gustan las simetrías. And we also like symmetries, so we wanted to use this structure for, uh, for duality. And it is well known that the dual can be obtained in a very symmetric way, so it will be the supremum of the sum of minus the conjugate functions of each of the functions, and each of these conjugates are uh, inseparable vari variables, and the um, variables are in the dual spaces of each of the original primal spaces. And uh, to keep the symmetry, the uh, constraint which we had in the primal variable becomes in the dual the orthogonal subspace to uh, the orthogonal subspace to the primal constraint. So it's a perfect symmetry between primal and dual. Okay, so this is the comment that I just made that it includes every single optimization problem because every single optimization problem uh, which is the minimization of a convex function subject to a convex set C can be written as the sum of the uh, minimization of the original function in the first variable plus the indicator function of the subspace uh, the indicator function of C which is the original constraint set in the uh, subspace which is the diagonal of the space so it's very easy to see that these problems are equivalent. So this is a nice setting for studying arbitrary uh, convex problems um, where you have a convex lower semi-continuous function as an objective. Okay, so, uh, but not only theoretical, uh, this has been used in applications, this framework, this same framework is used in applications. For example, uh, Bertsekas has used this, uh, Bertsekas and you have used this to this kind of model to define a polyhedral approximation for convex optimization problems. Okay, so now let's look, let's go to constraint qualification. So the main the main topic will be constraint qualifications and the comparisons between them. So uh, Bertsekas in 2010 wrote a paper about zero duality gap for monotropic programming problems and he used a very interesting constraint qualification in the proof of zero duality gap. So the constraint qualification that he used is that he requested that the orthogonal to the subspace uh, S plus the, the Cartesian product of the epsilon subdifferentials of the function, so this this uh, set here is a subset of the Cartesian product of all the sets. So this, the sum of this epsilon subdifferential Cartesian product plus the orthogonal to S is a closed space. And it's a closed set, sorry, it's a closed set. So you know that the sum of closed sets is not necessarily closed. You need a constraint qualification to ensure that the uh, sets, uh, uh, the sum of two uh, two convex sets, two closed sets are closed. So this, this uh, constraint qualification was used in his proof to show uh, zero duality gap because in the proof he was used the epsilon subdifferential method, the idea of epsilon subdifferential search direction to show, it was a very nice proof, beautiful proof, to show that uh, he gets duality gap. However, in the, because he used in the proof, it was not clear what was the exact relationship between this condition and zero duality gap. Because the fact that you use it in the proof doesn't mean that it's really connected with the fact of zero duality gap. We will see later on that it is really connected with that. So uh, there is, uh, we, we decided to rewrite this constraint qualification uh, in a way of the sum of the epsilon subdifferentials of these functions fi, and these functions fi are no longer 
defined in the products, in, in the separable variables, but these are functions defined like uh, fi of x uh, is fi of xi for every i. So I should use I should use a bar here to distinguish them, but just for, by an abuse of notation, accept this as just uh, this equality. So it's like extending the function to the whole space, but in the end, this function only depends on the variable xi. I, I have to mention that the Bertseka's paper was written for finite dimensions, but Boch and Chesnick extended the result of zero duality gap to the case of locally convex spaces. And their proof is totally different than the proof used by Bertsekas. So their proof of zero duality gap is totally different and that gives a hint that this condition is important, uh, intrinsically important to the problem, not to the proof. Okay, so let's go back and let's call this condition, which is the sum of the epsilon subdifferentials, the condition that the sum of the epsilon subdifferentials is weak start closed. So you can think that the sum of these sets is closed for every epsilon positive and for every x in the intersection of the domain. This condition is going to be called the Bertsekas constraint qualification. And um, you may ask, why is this? Why are these conditions uh, one? Uh, re, 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 one uh, why are these conditions equivalent? Because if you take if you take one of these functions as the indicator function of the subspace, then the epsilon subdifferential of the indicator function of the subspace is nothing but the orthogonal of the subspace. Because when you have a subspace the epsilon subdifferential is just the differential of the space and the, uh, and the differential of this, of this space, the normal cone to the, to the, the normal cone, uh, the subdifferential of the indicator function of S is the normal cone to S which is the orthogonal to the space. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So you, you have to, cons to ask that this sum is closed and this is, co this is going to be called from now on the Bertsekas constraint qualification. And uh, the relationship with other knowns of closeness conditions that you may, may ask, what is the relationship with the, uh, requ with, the request, with the requirement that the sum of the epigraphs of the conjugate functions is weak star closed? This is known as the closed epigraph condition and um, it was presented in a paper with Jaya Kumar in 2005 and the relationship is not fully known but what is known is that the closed epigraph condition is not stronger than Bertseka's constraint qualification. In fact, you, there are examples, we have found an example in, uh, in which you have that the, constraint, the closed epigraph condition does not imply Bersekas constraint qualification. So there are some, some open problems here. Okay, so uh, let me just remind a definition, a definition of infimal convolution, which is uh, the infimum of the sum of a, the infimum of a finite sum of functions such that the function the first function is in z1 the last function is in zm where the sum of z1 plus z2 plus zm is equal to z this is well known uh, definition from convex analysis and is uh, known as the infimal convolution and it's very well known as well and this is in um, maybe i read in the first time in Laurent, Laurent book on approximations that zero duality gap is equivalent to the fact that the conjugate of the sum at the point zero is equal to the infimal convolution of the conjugate functions at the point zero. So zero duality gap can be stated as the equality, the equality of two functions at zero. And uh, this induces um, the following constraint qualification for zero duality gap. This is very natural. And I will call this condition the red tree condition. And the red tree condition is that 
the conjugate function of the sum at x star is equal to the infimal convolution of the conjugate functions at the point x star. So of course, if it happens at every x star, it will happen at x star equals zero, and then you will have zero duality gap. So this is a natural kind of constraint qualification for, having, for ensuring zero duality gap. And um, the other closeness property that I will introduce here and uh, I think this is related with the paper, with the work that Abdel Rahim has uh, presented, and this will be called the red, uh, the red bird condition. <laughs> the red bird condition says that there exists a constant k positive, such that for every element in the domain and for every epsilon positive, the weak star closure of the sum of the epsilon subdifferentials is contained in the sum of some factor of the epsilon subdifferential. So this set here, this set on the on the right hand side, has a similar structure to the set between square brackets here. They have a similar structure. The only difference is that the epsilon is replaced by a positive factor of epsilon. So this in general will be, k in general will be bigger than one, bigger than or equal to one. So what we are saying is that the closure, when you take the closure, the set that you, you are still in, inside some set which has a similar structure that the set of which you took the closure. And uh, this, is, this now shows what exactly is the relationship with Berzeka's constraint qualification. Because Berzeka's constraint qualification was saying that the sum of this element, the sum of this epsilon subdifferential is closed for every epsilon. And this means that the BERT condition is true for k equal to 1. Because if k is equal to 1, then this sum is closed, then this weak star closure is the same set, and you are contained in this set for k equal to 1. So k equal 1 has a critical uh, role there. And this shows why Berzeka's constraint qualification implies uh, zero duality cap. In fact, you still don't know why, because you still don't know what the relationship is between the bird and the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, this will show what the relationship is. So this is the, the graph of the conditions and uh, what is in green, what is in green is what I will show, or if I have time, what I will show in this, what I will recall in this talk. So um, this here are the interiority conditions. So interiority conditions, uh, let me just tell you what the interiority conditions are. Uh, this is the way in which I will state in this talk interiority conditions. I will say that they hold if the domain of one of the functions intersects the interior of the domain of all other functions. So I have to take the interior of all the other functions. Uh, okay, so now let's go to this. So the interiority condition is the strongest one. So in the left hand side we have the strongest, in the right hand side we have the weakest condition. So what, what uh, I will show is that the tree condition, which is the equality between the two functions, the equality between the conjugate of the sum and the, convolu the infimal convolution of the conjugates, is equivalent to the bird condition. So that bird condition is equivalent to the tree. And this, this shows really why you have zero duality gap with Berzeka's constraint qualification. Because uh, Berzeka's constraint qualification is, uh, implies the bird condition. And therefore, it implies zero duality gap. Uh, and that I have just shown. I have just shown you why it's very uh, why uh, Berzeka's constraint qualification implies the bird. So uh, this is just a reminder of which of of each of the the conditions. And then another comment is that the tree plus exactness is equivalent to the closed epigraph condition. Um, the closed epigraph condition. Uh, implies the bird condition, but the bird condition does not imply the the uh, closed epigraph condition. And the part which is open, the part which is open, is the relationship between the closed epigraph condition and Berzeka's constraint qualification, 
We know that Bersica's constraint qualification does not imply the closed epigraph condition, but we haven't been able to prove if the closed epigraph condition uh, would imply Bersica's constraint qualification. That's, that's, uh, that's open to us. And of course, uh, Salinescu and Boch and Vanka have shown that interior conditions are stronger than the closed epigraph condition. So this is more or less the, the picture. And uh, now I will show um, a formula which is connected with what Abderrahim has uh, shown to you before. So uh, this, this formula appears in the book of uh, Salinescu. It says that the epsilon sub differential of the sum is the intersection for every eta positive of the union of the union over epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 bigger than epsilon or epsilon plus eta of the sum of the epsilon subdifferentials and this is a formula that allows you to express the epsilon subdifferential of the sum as the sum of epsilon subdifferentials but is somehow ugly because it has this closure here so you would like to get rid of the closure and you would like to get rid of all these uh, peripheral symbols. The, the, the less peripheral symbols you have, the better in the expression of your formula. And uh, we will see that there, we, will we use this formula in our proof and our situation will allow us, I will, I will, our con constraint qualification will allow us to give a simpler expression of this formula because this formula has no constraint qualification at all. It holds in any case. Okay, so um, here we will assume that f bar is equal to f i for every i and we will assume that this equality is true in the intersection of the domain of the closures. Then what happens, and it can be proved, it's not easy to show, but it can be proved that the tree condition is equivalent to the bird condition and this is equivalent to the weak lower semi-continuity of the convolution uh, of, uh, of the conjugate functions. And this allows us to give a simpler expression of the formula that I have just shown so you get rid of the closure here. You can get rid of that closure if you assume if you assume this uh, three condition. It's really equivalent. Okay, so this I, I, already, I already mentioned this, so I won't uh, distract you with this. Uh, now, the, uh, the other uh, property that I shown uh, before, that I mentioned before, is that the closed epigraph condition is equivalent to the three plus exactness, and uh, we have shown that we, so we have shown that this property is true. I will not uh, bother you with the proof, but this, this is a fact. And what uh, this, this uh, condition allowed us to show, and uh, I think this is an interesting result, is that under the interiority condition, you can show that for every x, this set is weak star closed. So uh, let me just mention something that uh, the result that is known is that if you have a point in the <coughs> interior of the domain, then the epsilon subdifferential is is a compact is weakly compact set. That's what is known. But what we have here is that for every x in the intersection of the domain, the sum of this set is weak star closed, which is a stronger result than than that. And uh, the, I will uh, finish by showing some results, uh, some implications of this formula for sublinear functions. So when you have sublinear functions, you can uh, get stronger results. And what happens is that for sublinear functions, all the, most of the constraint qualifications I just mentioned collapse into the same equivalent property. So if you have that all the functions are proper sublinear and fi bar is equal to fi, so I also don't ask lower semi-continuity, just, we just ask fi equal to the closure of fi on the intersection of the domains. So then the tree condition and the bird condition, they are all equivalent to the weak lower semi-continuity of the infimal convolution. They are, equi they are equivalent to the simplified version of Salinescu's formula and they are also uh, equivalent to the fact that 
some kind of Bertzekas constraint qualification, but without the epsilon here. Because when you have sublinear functions, you can get rid of the epsilon in the, in the subdifferential. And it's also equivalent to the closed epigraph condition. And uh, uh, it's equivalent to the three, this, this would be the three condition in X star. And this is also equivalent to the subdifferential sum, the subdifferential, uh, the sum subdifferential formula, because uh, this this was known already for the closed epigraph condition. But because now the closed epigraph condition is equivalent to the tree condition, then you obtain that this uh, sub subdifferential sum formula uh, uh, holds under this weaker. Uh, simply uh, condition. Uh, another, maybe if I still have some minutes, Michel, yes, yes? Um, I will speak about this property. Uh, how the ruin ha ha if you have mentioned this formula, uh, here to Ruti Phelps formula for the subdifferential sum. So it's the intersection of this closure of subdifferential, the closure of the sum of the subdifferentials for every uh, eta positive. And it is known that under closed epigraph condition, you can get rid of all the peripheral symbols. You can get rid of the intersection, you can get rid of the closure. So uh, the closed e epigraph condition allows you to get uh, this property. Now, it then is we could say, what happens if we request the BERT condition? If, if we ask the BERT condition, then what are the symbols that we can get rid of? So what happens is that with the, red, with the uh, BERT condition, you can get rid of the closure property. So you get rid of the closure property, and then you get a certain simplification. So that more or less indicates what the difference is, or what the strength, what the difference of strength you have between these two conditions. And then I will finish with some open questions. So uh, the first question is that what I mentioned before: what is the real relationship between closed epigraph condition and Bertzika's constraint qualification? And uh, the second, the second one is really uh, a rephrase of the first one, and how these re these properties extend to this kind of uh, because we we focused on sums of functions. What if instead of having sum of functions, we have this this uh, expression in the objective function? So how does these conditions uh, translate? And uh, another question, and this is. Um, maybe more interesting for me is that uh, our constraint qualification is based on epsilon subdifferentials. What if we take another kind of enlargement of the subdifferential? Can we uh, deduce the same equivalences? And can, can, can we use an expression with this uh, enlargement and still obtain a, quali a constraint qualification? And the other thing is that once you use enlargement, you can think of maximal monotone operators and you can think about variational inequalities. If we can think of uh, this condition as a way of going to a constraint qualification for variational in inequalities. That's all. I wanted to say that you can download this paper from the archive, but it will soon appear in Journal of Convex Analysis. Thank you.